Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all the ST types. And so Brian, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure, my name's Brian. Uh, I'm 43 year old, married father of two girls. I'm an ISTP and I sometimes talk about it on my YouTube channel, but not all the time. Cool, Brian has a YouTube channel called The Genzennial. Feel free to check it out for his many videos of his opinions and memes. Yeah. Thanks. And Amy? Hi, my name is Amy. I'm about late 30s. I have four kids. I'm married to an INFP. And you can find me on Twitter. Awesome. And Charles? Hello, everybody. My name is Charles. I'm a ESTP, and I believe Enneagram 3 Wing 2. And um, <clears throat> I guess a little bit about me. I just like outdoors. I like traveling, partying, having fun. Those are just kind of my focuses in life. And that's a little bit about me. Excellent. And Ryan Amara. Hi, I'm, I'm Ryan. I am an ISTJ and I uh, got into typology probably about uh, 10, 11 years ago. And i uh, been doing it with uh, my partner Amara here for long time. Uh, we write on a typology blog and we're happy to be here. Yay. Happy to have you both. And so Ryan and Mara have a grand spanking typology blog <laughs> called Practical Typing. So feel free to check out their articles because they're very good at representing the sensor experience accurately. They're the real deal. And so, hi everyone, my name's Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. I also type and coach people. All right, so SD types, what do you believe you all share in common? If I were to just generalize on, on my own observation of the STs, uh, I find we're probably uh, stern, maybe, a little more on the stern side. Uh, that I, I've tried to, uh, I, I don't, um, I don't necessarily involve myself in other types too much. Uh, but my general observation is the STs tend to be no nonsense, uh, a little bit stern and to the point. And hey, you know, let's let's get to the point here. Let's get it done. Uh, and don't don't BS me. They're very good with reality checks and keeping things grounded. Great. I want to. Uh... Did you say SE types or ST types? Oh, I S S -E. oh ST. Sorry. Oh, did, did I say SE? Uh, <laughs> I, I could be wrong. Uh, as far as like ST types, I would say exactly what he said. Like focus on concrete facts, what reality is, what is. I feel like a lot of types outside of it are focused on uh, what things could be or having like a lot of ideals. And, you know, I guess from my like biased perspective as ST, I feel like that can blind them from what's right in front of them. And I've noticed that like a lot of the ST types that I speak to or ST, I think I said ST now, like they agree with my perspective where it's like, it's kind of like the facts. Everything is concrete right in front of us. Uh, we don't need to go like, you know, a bunch of theories and things that we can't see like right there. And so that's why I would notice like a lot of ST types that I know personally, we tend to sit, share that like same viewpoint on life. I think we have a tendency to um, recognize feelings, but not weigh them as heavily as other types do. Like they're a factor in the equation. Like, you know, we don't want to make people unhappy, but if to get to the answer, you're going to be unhappy, guess what? You're going to be unhappy. And there are times I'm going to be unhappy because I'm also perfectly willing to be unhappy to get to the point, get to the answer too. And I think one of the things is we really appreciate a beautifully executed job. Like whether it was executed really well because it was done fast or whether it was intricate, but like a well done job. Like, I think all of us like can sit there and watch and go, that's incredible. Like you are good at that. Like, you know, you get, you get things done, you know, it's just, we could sit there and watch you know, appreciate that kind of stuff. I think that's an interesting perspective that I too share because, but it's interesting. I think it's different. I don't know about like if the ISTP wants, I think there's two on here who want to chime in, but it seems like I've noticed this STJs, they they care about like the, the process or like 
the end of the process and it being done smoothly. Whereas with that SE, I kind of care about the movement through that process. So it's like, if somebody has like an amazing golf swing, cause I go golfing quite a bit. Like mm -hmm. if I see the smoothness of like how, how their stroke, that something is something that I will like marvel at and try to recreate. I know it's like SCJs similarly, like we like the smoothness of action, but it's like SCJs will look back and be like, yo, this was perfectly orchestrated this plan or this was perfectly ran at the job or whatever process it may be, but it seems to be more process focused. There are differences in the particularities of a job well done we like, but the fact we like a job well done, you know, I think still is a unifying feature to us. You know, other people like, um, prioritize other things more, you know, a plan more or a, you know, other things where for us, it's, uh, and, you know, I think also to a greater degree, you, you guys, STPs may appreciate the, the method more, you know, beauty method, but I think, uh, STJs, we're kind of like second in appreciating that, you know, like, we're one of the types that's a lot closer to appreciating that than several other types. It may not be our number one focus, but it's still pretty high for us as a something we would notice. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the reverse is also true for you guys. Like you would still look at the end results, which we might look at more and go, Hey, yeah. that's <laughs> Yeah. It's definitely that's like nice a but it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. How about Ryan and Mara? I think there's definitely a a shared sense of appreciation for people that are able to get things done or just movement in general. Um, I think basically all the ST types on some level get a little bit impatient when things start taking too long. Um, the STP is more from an SC perspective and the STJ is more from a TE perspective, but at the end of the day, both of them are going to want to see movement on a project. If it sits too long, it's it's kind of going to get stale or uh, make you kind of get a little antsy. Um, I just think just having that high sensing function and the high thinking function together like that kind of makes you want to, you, you kind of you look at the process and then you want to act upon it kind of thing that happens. And that's something that I've noticed between Mara and myself is that we tend to mesh when there is a where there's a shared project we don't come at it the same way but um we have a similar perspective on it in in a general sense where we both kind of want to see progress within the project otherwise um we're going to lose interest in it one way or another mm -hmm. really well put and this is where you can see potential mistyping happening because someone might confuse ST traits for being just TE. So when someone wants to get things done, they might assume, oh, it's an NTJ, but really it's an ESTP who's just very get things done. And so that's something to look out for as well. Yeah. What do you guys think about when, you, when you're going on there about, um, you know, what about uh, getting things done in a conversation? I felt like I was, I was relating more to like, uh, when a conversation is just not quite getting to the point. Yeah. I, I often find myself wanting to say, okay, can you get to the point? Okay, can you get to the point? That happens a lot. Maybe <laughs> in a similar like, way to uh, <laughs> how we were talking about the physical world. I mean, I totally agree with you. Unless the, the only exception I can think to that is for an SCJ would be, if I need the sequence of events to understand what your point is, would you please get the sequence going? Like, you can't just necessarily jump to the end on me. I won't follow. It's right. not a guarantee. But if you don't get the sequence going, I'm going to be very frustrated with you that you have not got the sequence going and getting in. And, and the sequence needs to go fast. Like, can't take forever with the sequence to get to the end either. Like, that would, you know, I'm not going to give you forever to to do that either yeah i definitely feel like when talking to people it has to have a reason it has to be leading to some type of goal that i need achieved i can't just like endlessly go on obviously if it's like a point where we're just relaxing chilling it's like 
if we're just out, like let's say you're at a football game or something, like obviously you can shoot the shit with the person next to you. But at the end of the day, most of my conversations tend to have a point behind them, I would say. And I think we like learning about like things that are going on. My sister just uh, had her first little puppies. She's starting to breed golden doodles. And like every time I'm over at her house, we're often talking about our puppies and she's explaining her business and the business model and how this all goes. And even though I'm not planning on ra breeding puppies, I'm not terribly much of a dog person at the this point in my life. I have small children and my house is not suited for it. I still find that sensory stuff interesting to deal with you know like it still gives a purpose to the conversation to learn you know about this you know as we're doing as we're talking about it that kind of sounds like si to me yeah it is i don't That's... i don't relate to that if i'm gonna remember anything i have to have a reason to remember it yep same here oh i, I relate to it though yeah. it, <laughs> that's where the st kind of diverges what you consider there being a point is going to differ between the STJs and the STPs. Yes. I need to know in advance yeah. why I'm listening to this and why I actually need to try to remember it for me to have any chance of remembering it. Yeah, there there is a difference in background there, but you know, driving to a point, yes, I think that's yes. Yeah. Sure. Now, I wonder if there's a difference between ESTP and ISTP where I feel like I get what you mean, like you have to have a point to remember it, but I'm really almost looking for action points within like what's being said. Like I'm looking for places to take action in the future or now, rather than like trying to remember, it's like, I'm not gonna remember the word verbatim, but I remember what it means to do, if that makes sense. It, has, it all comes back to doing or taking action for me. Mm -hmm. What advice? And there's almost a feeling of action within the conversation. Mm -hmm. you know, if 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 you're getting a lot of what 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 I might determine as like meaningless data, you know that to me is a is a stalled progress. You know I want I would continually want uh, the the data that's going to get us to the point to where we can resolve what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean I tend to with information either store it as this is important because it relates to this person and gives me something to understand about them, or it's how can I cross contextualize this in a sensory manner, not an intuitive manner, <laughs> in a sensory matter to something else. Like, you know, is there something about her business plan that she's talking about it that I could use if I wanted to do my own business? Like, is there something about, you know, different, different things you know how does this affect other people like can would this be helpful information to tell other people oh this is why this is so unique and different you know store that information for the next time i run into somebody that's you know says they want something i'm like oh wait i actually know an answer for that you know but that's really awesome and so we were talking earlier about the different types of information that STJs versus STPs consume. And I wonder maybe if we could go more into that. What types of forms of consumption do you all do? You mean like info? How do we prefer our info delivered to us? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Probably visually for me or experiential. Like I learn by doing rather than reading it beforehand and then remembering the steps or, which is what I imagine is STJs are like, but I'm not sure. For me, it has to be facts or something really exciting. Like either if, if it's going to be a movie, it has to be action packed. Uh, if I'm and otherwise, I'd prefer to be learning something, something real. Uh, I would prefer to, that what I learn is useful to some degree. You know, if I can't find a use for it, that makes it a lot harder. And I prefer that my information starts at least concretely because I just can't follow if it starts to intellectually. I've, I've been listening to a couple podcasts recently on archetypes and whenever they start there, I always, I start so lost. I'm like, if architects make sense to you, you must be talking to an ENTJ because they just don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Like I've listened to several different ones from different people who are good at trying to explain this. And I'm still half the time feel so lost about all of it, um, which is just frustrating. Uh, I prefer my information sequentially. Um, I'm a visual learner, so I, don't, I do appreciate a demonstration beforehand. 
um, as far as that goes to doing something. But I'm not going to want to sit there and watch too many times before I try. Like, you know, I want one demonstration and then let me try, you know, unless it's like terribly complicated, you know. And then, um, oh, I'd say also we, sorry, something I think all of us appreciate is constructive feedback. You know, that's something I think all of us would appreciate, particularly if we're getting something in the physical realm wrong, you know, constructive feedback of how to do it better is actually something that we appreciate about each other because we, STPs and STJs have very different styles of learning to do things quickly and well. And so when the other side figures out a better method and can demonstrate, usually I'm really appreciative of that. Like, because mm -hmm. they've got a different way of doing it. So if they can show me their way, it, it, I usually can appreciate that because it's well done. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. How about Ryan and Mara? I am a visual learner primarily. Uh, I have to do it, I have to read it. Reading actually is a big one for me. Anything when someone's talking at me, I have a hard time keeping it. Um, and I have to see a point for it. Yeah, and that's, that's another place where I think the definition of point changes between the two types because what Mara might not view as there being a point to the information, I might. So that, that does happen quite frequently where I will want to pull in a bunch of information that she sees no point in pulling in. And then I will go on a tangent about it's like, no, because in a month from now, if that doesn't happen, then this is going to happen. And that's the significance of me pulling this piece of information right now. And I was like, yes, but there's nothing significant about it now. So I don't care because it's not actionable now. It's actionable in two months. I'll worry about it in two months. I just hear the any, oh, what if maybe one day I need to remember this coming? <laughs> That's how I translate it in my head. Well, yeah, I have to agree with Ryan because, like, if I don't take the time to collect more information than is essential right now, I can't adjust for next time. Because I'm a post-processor, if I don't collect more data than I actually need, I can't adjust well next time. Where you guys adjust better on the fly than we do. And so it's not as critical that you gather more information beforehand. Like, I, there's a limit to how much information I can imagine beforehand. So I imagine better afterwards. So once I've done something once, that's when I go out and realize I've got gaps in my knowledge and I need to need enough that I can do my plan. And then if my plan is breaking, a couple different options after that. I need a reference point. Mm -hmm. I, if I don't I have need, a reference point, I, I can't, I can't work off it. I need a bank of knowledge. SI needs a bank. Of, that's how SI works. It's a bank of knowledge that to draw on. Um, I think, uh, it. Okay, my bad. I can't. I can't make any kind of plans. I think a big difference is that uh, T I T E, possibly with the S I S C. Like, I know we were talking about in the E S T P episode, and we all agreed that like we build frameworks off of past experiences that are pretty accurate. So whether we have the facts or not, like I generally feel pretty confident that I have enough experiences to deal with what's in front of me. Like I, I built a framework from those experiences, like a one plus one equals two, like it's really that simple, everything. And I can use that, but it seems like uh, with TESI, it's like at the same time, they're more comfortable when they have like the actual data in their memory, like the, the actual, like exactly what I did at this time. Like if they have that, then they can perform. But it seems like TISE or SETI, we kind of rely more on, like I said, frameworks, archetypes, all types of different things like that through our TI that allow us to go to different situations and why we don't think we need those facts. Yeah, I, think, I can be incorrect sometimes though. Yeah, but I think the thing is with SI, I was just listening to your IC, I, ISFJ panel, Joyce, and they were talking about how they're swimming in their SI, that they can't avoid remembering events and how it made them feel. And I can't, I can somewhat avoid it, 
but it they just having that bank of experience knowledge in my reaction to it my evaluation of it is just such a fundamental part of me that trying to get away from it feels very um it leaves me antsy it's like, like stressful it, it's stressful to get away from that bank of knowledge that bank of knowledge is my like launching pad for success mm -hmm. and it always has been my launching pad for success so if i have to abandon that it's it's very stressful because then I don't know how successful I will be, which mm -hmm. is a different kind of stress because I don't deal well with not feeling like I succeeded when I think I should have. Like, I don't, I don't plan, I can't, I don't deal with failure well. Like mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's why I post process so I don't fail. So if I don't have enough stuff, you know, to do that, then it feels very much like I'm, I don't have a method by which to judge how well I did either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's stressful going into a completely new experience where you have zero reference points. So having an any bank of knowledge is useful. SI bank of knowledge. Oh, sorry. SI. SI bank of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, going back to what Charles said about the SETI versus the SITE, if, if you think about basically what that means is the SI is the sensing introverted versus the TI being the thinking introverted. So like he was saying, TI is going to fundamentally relying on the logical framework inside their mind. If they think it makes sense, if they can make it make sense, they're not worried about it. So if a TI user is walking up to a problem is like, this makes sense to me. I, I think I know, understand what's going on. They don't need to watch a video about it. They don't need to go ask somebody else about it. They're like, I can logic my way through this. My TI framework has enough that I can work with that I can just play. I can do my SE and mess with the different parts, see what it does, and then get it to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. You got to, with the SITE, it's like completely, in, it's, it's inverted. I'm going to walk up to it and go, in order for me to understand this, I need to have seen it before. Mm. And if I can replay what I've seen before, I can TE recreate the steps to create a similar result. So I'm kind of like flipping it. The thinking is going to be in the outside world where it's like, I can replicate what I've seen before. And I can make it do the same thing that I saw it do before. I'm not necessarily banking on me being able to just logic my way through it unless i have seen it happen in the real world before i'm not really wild about just messing with things to see if it happens because i was gonna say when, when you happens, said that, I, I tend to break things <laughs> when you said that they want to play their way through it i just cringed i'm like i do not want to play my way through it that that sounds just like I'm going to break something. Like if I play my, right. I, I'm going to either break my reputation because I'm going to fail or I'm going to break the item because I don't know my own force. Like, I mean, but yeah, I, and I've done that. <laughs> I've sat there and tried to play with something and it did, at the end of it, it resulted in me in breaking a part of the thing I was working on because in my head, this is about yay big and it should go there. It didn't go there. And then I made it go there, and then it broke. <laughs> so it's kind of like not having that SE, because I think like with SE, you can feel the pressure of things. You can feel like, even if it's a conversation, like let's say it, if it's a confrontation, an argument, anything, even if physically working on a car, that SE is very aware of pressure, I guess you could say. At least that's how I feel. I am very aware of like pressure and how much I'm applying, how much I'm not, how much I need to. And it's just kind of like I'm swimming in that. Like I always know the action to take. So it's kind of like if you have SI and don't have SE, then you're almost like if you're working on a car, you're not thinking like, hmm, how does this feel in my hand? How does this fit? You're thinking I did this last time. Do it again without thinking about how it feels or anything in the moment. You're like going back to your memory and trying to recreate it regardless of how it feels. Yeah, right there. I mean, my sense of feels is uh a learned thing. Like I can learn the right amount of pressure to put on that, mm -hmm. but it's, it tends to be more by repetition than mm -hmm. instinct. Like, yeah. but the flip side is <laughs> I've watched many, uh, 
uh, SE users, they do something great, but then they can't quite replicate it necessarily. I can replicate. Like if I've done it successfully, I can replicate it again and do it again and do it again. And that's something that for, I think, SE dumps, that's their learned skill is to replicate where for me, my learned skill is to apply pressure correctly the first time. That's, that's a learned skill for me. You know, there are some things where, um, when we're faced with a new, new project, if my new project is similar to a last project, sometimes I can still get through it. Okay. If it's mm -hmm. similar, but it just depends on how similar it is to a, a previous experience. You know, if this looks pretty similar to that, you know, I can do it. And sometimes there are occasional times where it's like, oh, I can recognize this piece of what we're doing. Like I was trying to pull, um, we'd managed to get a TV inside a desk. It was a very large TV and mm -hmm. I was trying to get it back out. And all of a sudden I realized, oh wait, there are Phillips head screws like up in the top board piece. I wonder, cause this side's coming apart. If I go over and screw the other side, can I lift the lid and slide the TV out, you know, like, mm -hmm. but it took me a while to really think of that. And then I had, I looked at the Phillips and went, oh wait, I do know how Phillips screws work. Mm -hmm. I do know where my husband keeps the Phillips screwdrivers. <laughs> now yeah. I can try to, you know, I will walk downstairs. Yeah. I will go get them. I will try this. Like, but I'm pretty sure an SC person would have caught that a little bit sooner, like it, than I did necessarily, right. yeah. <laughs> unless you do spend a lot of time taking apart furniture and using screwdrivers all the time, in which case then it comes a lot faster for us. Yeah. And I would agree with that uh, first point you made. I think it is the opposite because I feel like I have worked like hard on, like it's definitely my secondary, the replication of something that I did the first time very well, but being able to like recreate that is definitely something I have to work at for some reason. That's, I've never thought about that, but that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone can do everything, but what is your first easier choice to do? So it's almost like, what is the thing you start with is more of the one that's more true to your type. And then you can learn the other side, but it takes a little more effort. Yeah. And speaking of replication, now I'm just curious about all of your cooking styles. How do you approach cooking? The reason why I asked this is I have an ESTP friend and they cook well this is a special circumstance though they had a friend that couldn't eat salt and so what they did was uh they experimented with spices and they added different spices to let's say like an egg or something whatever they were making and he was doing it to taste so he was like tasting how it would taste in the moment and then just adding in the spices as his body kind of calibrated for him and i think if you asked him to make the same eggs twice it would be kind of difficult because he's like, well, I just grabbed it. I tasted it and I tried to experiment with it. And my body kind of told me if I should add it or not. But it's a little more difficult to replicate because it's more of a intuitive body thing. Yeah. I was going to say, that's an interesting insight. I feel like I just kind of just do and then adjust as I go, exactly like you said. So I'd say that's exactly my same approach. <laughs> I cook for utility. Basically, I eat and cook for utility. I, my goal is to not ruin it. <laughs> if it can be consumed and it gives me sustenance, then then it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm a very much a buy the book on all measurements that matter. Like, you know, like flour, salt, sugar, you know, baking powder, all those things that you have to get right. Otherwise it will fail. Like I'm pretty much careful about this. Um, but spices as a general rule, I tend to add more than whatever it calls for because most things I don't recipes, I don't find to be spiced as well as they should be. Mm. But, um, uh, I wish I was a little bit more consistent about being able to track how much additional spices I was able to use so I could repeat that, but I don't sit there adding quarter teaspoons more to my sauce to that's just too much of a waste of time to track. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I do like to try to remember when I 
did something well, what were the finer points of it? You know, like I love the fact that like in America's tisk test kitchen at the, you know, after they demonstrate something at the end, they're like, and these were the important points that you need to remember to replicate in order to get this recipe right. You know, and they like give you like the top three things that is very different than standard, you know? And I love that because I'm like, oh yes, okay. If I can remember those points, you know, I can probably get a good result. Makes sense. How about Ryan and Mara? I have things that I just kind of make. I have other times where I start with a recipe and I may or may not follow it as it's written. <laughs> just kind of depends on how much I'm paying attention and what I think of the recipe, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes I'm merging three of them together in different ways. Now, what about Thanksgiving? Like, is everybody piling all their food into the center and mixing it up? And or is that a no-no for you guys? I'm like, you know, That's right in there. <laughs> there are a few things that, you know, mix together, like, you know, gravy and turkey, gravy and, you know, stuffing or mashed potatoes, but, and then like, you know, cranberry sauce on the turkey, and, you know, if you decide to go that route. But um, no, I don't necessarily usually mix things that were not intended to be mixed. Although I did find interesting left those, um, mashed potato bowls like from kfc introduced like where you know they mashed potatoes and then they kind of layered thanksgiving equivalencies on top of it that was like a very novel and not so bad but if you actually handed me that for thanksgiving i'd be highly disappointed like i don't like that would be a great leftovers of thanksgiving you want to hand me that as a meal that's fine but if you handed me that as my thanksgiving meal i would my si would be throwing such massive fits over the fact it wasn't like previous years that you know they would i'm an adult now but <laughs> that's amazing like, i'd be crying but i might oh. try to hide that from you depending on oh. what's going on <laughs> oh no <laughs> how about um brian it depends on what it is sometimes i mix it sometimes i don't it really just depends on the mood i mean if i like it I'll eat it that way, if that makes any sense. It's it's mostly going off of my own taste preference. I don't necessarily think there is a right way other than to say that it's the way that I like it. So if I like it mixed, I'll mix it. If I don't like it mixed, I won't mix it. If I like it both ways, I might mix it sometimes and not others. That's just kind of where I sit on that for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. yeah but it's it is reflective of the fact that he's got a visceral response to having done those things before and that's what he's going off of if si is a visceral response i mean we either know whether or not we like the result or didn't so i think one of the other differences is i've watched sc users repeat the same dumb mistake sometimes like it's like what you know you don't like it that way. Why did you do it that way? And you won't catch an SI user probably doing that unless they're totally sleep deprived. You know, like, we will remember the fact we did not like that result and we will try everything in our power not to replicate that as a result. Yeah, they will be beating themselves if they do do that. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. It, we, I mean, it's, it's one of those things I have to watch as a parent because, you know, my kids will make the same, you know, bad choice over again and it's like don't you doesn't that feel horrible i want to look at them and say that no and, it doesn't that's it's the like, thing <laughs> it, it, sometimes it's like sometimes they do realize and then they're like yeah that doesn't feel good and then sometimes they, they don't care and other times i'm like okay you may not care that you didn't spray the bowl before we mixed eggs and cooked them in the microwave because you don't have to wash the bowl that has a million stuck eggs to it now but I care, so you really need to care because I'm tired of scrubbing that much out of there because you wouldn't remember the one step we keep talking about every day. Spray the bowl first. <laughs> yeah, I feel like to avoid doing, because I definitely agree, like when I was a kid, I was always doing things with my parents were like, didn't we just talk about this? And it's like, oh, yeah, whatever, man. Like it really has to do with like, if like once it affects us though, then like, you'll see us start to pay attention. If there's no person there to like handle it. So like when I moved to, you know, my when I went to college and I was like in the dorms and like I actually had to like make sure I was handling these different things, like whether it was like eggs stuck to a plate or whatever, best believe like 
we ain't doing that no more. But it really just has to do with like if we've experienced like if we're going to have a bad experience, like that's what needs to happen. Like I think with SE users, they need to equate it to a bad experience to like really remember and uh, make sure that they don't make the mistake again. At least in my experience. It has to be a bad enough experience. Yeah. I think the benchmark benchmark for SI and SE on bad experience are very different. That's true. I feel like on the STJ side of it, it's more of a binary. It's either it was bad or it was good. (laughs) For STPs, it almost feels like it's a sliding (laughs) scale of inconvenience. Yeah. (laughs) It has to inconvenience me this much for me to care. And if it doesn't pass this threshold of inconvenience, I'm just going to deal with it and not care. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's kind of what I've that. experienced. That's the perfect way. That's the perfect way of describing it. <laughs> yeah, and so speaking of experience, that's kind of um, oh, speaking of experience, that's kind of how I experience SI in the in the critical parent spot. Is it didn't really come until I was older. It's like yeah. my responsibility function. <laughs> Nobody wants to be responsible when they're younger and. <laughs> you realize after you, you know, screw up a couple times and, and and get older and learn responsibility that SI critical parent starts cracking the whip on you and it it just it it takes a while. It yeah, takes a long while. Definitely. Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I was talking with my husband about some um, the disappointments I was realizing about my childhood, and I was like man, I was never a child. Like I always like functioned as a parent, like, or in the sense of made adult responsibility choices. Like I never felt like I was free to just blow things off. You know, like that was like, I never felt that way. And part of it probably is being a one too, but you know, like an oldest child and parents got divorced when I was five, you know, like there's a, there's a multitude of reasons that combine for that feeling. But I think that's probably a, a fairly common feeling sometimes for STJs, a feeling like you've always been a level of mature that you look around and go, come on, catch up. You know, <laughs> we're already dealing with this. Come on. Ju- you know, it's, it's, fun. it's funny you say that because I've always felt that way by CJs growing up. Like, I didn't know about this before, but I can, like, pinpoint remembering they were the ones who were always kind of making sure, like, that the other kids were in line and stuff. And I think it's interesting because I think me and, like, other STPs I've talked to, and I'm not sure if you guys feel this way. I'm sure you do. Like, I feel like uh, mature, too, but in a different way, like mature with what I what I want. So like goals and stuff. And I'm not sure if some of this adult goes to any ground, but I realized like from a young age, I wasn't real mature about like doing the right thing or following rules, but I was really good at seeing like what needed to be done to get what I wanted out of situations or make like my my goals happen or whatever that is at like a faster rate than other kids like around me. And I wonder if that's like a SE thing, like of observing the landscape that maybe the STPs relate to at all, or if that's like a three thing, I don't know. I think um, a lot of ESTPs would relate to you on that. Yeah. Yeah. A a lot of ESTPs that are ambitious, they do actually expedite their goals in certain ways that that can look like extroverted thinking, but it's not. Extroverted sensing in general has an impatience to it. And plus, like, there's an opportunistic quality to some of the ESTPs I know. So they're trying to, like, find the quickest way to meet their goals, but it's not in a TE way. It's because they're like, there's all this BS around me. Like, how do I just like. It's like seeing what matters. Like there's so much stuff thrown at us that all of us that we're told is supposed to matter. That really doesn't. Once you get to the crux of things, there's a lot of stuff that falls away. And like, there will be like three main things. You, you achieve those objectives and everything else falls into place. So if I put all my SE energy into that, I'm going to be set later. But I won't necessarily like handle every single thing thrown at me because I don't need to do that. I'll delegate that to somebody else. Uh, Again, I think that's where FE comes in um, with us. But yeah, not to like sidetrack, but that's just something I noticed. Yeah, yeah. So extroverted sensing is about relevant information. So it's noticing, wow, there's all this irrelevant information around me. Mm -hmm. So I just focus on what's relevant and then go where I want to go with my TI. And that's funny that you said the ENTJ bit, because I get mistaken for that, like at work or things a lot, like people who know the system of 
tried to type me that and I obviously I'm not like I have ENTJ friends and we're very different, but it's interesting how from the outside, other people seem to think that you're operating with that TENI. Yeah. So the ESTP versus ENTJ mistyping happens extremely frequently and it's not talked about enough in the community. <laughs> yeah. Um, like most ESTPs in the community have been accused of being ENTJs in their life. <laughs> like if you're successful and you're an ESTP, like you're an ENTJ, and it's like, uh, no, well, like we're not all like if you're focused, You know, if you're, if you're not a goofball and you're a focused ESTJ, you must be using TE and it's like, that's not. Yeah. Like if you're, TE yeah. It doesn't have the sole um, proprietary interest on being focused, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's not but, that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's what I would say. I would say like a lot of times people have assumptions, especially about STs as a whole, because I seem maybe there's bias, but I feel like STJs, because I'm close with very many like ISTJs and a few ESTJs, they seem to be to me the most efficient at getting tasks done. Like if they have a list of ten things to do on like a Saturday. Like nobody's gonna get it done quicker than them. But people don't recognize that in the MBTI community. It's like you need the STs, you fools. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah. Yeah. ST is kind of like the invisible yeah. temperament. No, no one has officially yeah. talked about it, so people don't tend to consider it a thing. But yeah. it actually they have a lot of shared traits, and it's pretty useful to know about how STs kind of care about things like getting to the point, just in, they do it in different ways. And so they might have like a same type of psychological priority over certain things, but they go about it in different ways, depending on if they're an STJ or an STP. Mm -hmm. Like I've noticed um, a similar to uh, STPs in the side of like, I have a bit of a lazy streak of I'll put things off till the last minute. But when I put things off to the last minute, it's because I counted back from the end goal, how long it was going to take me. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I put it off because I know exactly when my last start time is to finish the project on time because I know how long it's going to take me. Where STPs um, have more of a, uh, I just don't want to do it now until they hit their, oh, junk, I got to do it now moment. And you never know when that's going to happen because my husband's an INFP and we <laughs> we have this same, similar kind of response to time sometimes of like we're we're supposed to be going somewhere and i know exactly how long beforehand it takes you know i need to be ready to like yeah and for him it is still we run into sometimes of he's like oh and oh no i am late and i am <laughs> like <laughs> he's trying to run as fast as he can to get things done and but he's a nfp not a stp so chances of actually being on time or not not great. I think that you guys would have a much better chance yeah. of being on time than he is. Yeah, we'll like blast and make it happen somehow, some way. But I know what you mean. Absolutely, yeah. That's an interesting contrast. So what I've noticed in my life is sometimes um, ESTJs and ISTJs can actually be a little more, for lack of a better word, maybe patient with starting things because they know exactly when they how long they can put it off before they have to actually start because it's almost like they factored in a plan and so they're like oh, okay well I have this much free time and literally I, you don't have to start it right now whereas I notice with SE dom dominant types especially is sometimes they want to do things like right now because they might forget if they don't, or they, they'll just put it off, but it, they don't have a specific linear way of tackling it specifically. So like when Mara was saying about the, that sliding scale of how, how much it needs to be before you go into action, like uh, 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 ESCPs have this like, like they know they're putting it off, but their anxiety is getting higher and higher and higher as until they hit the point of tripping it on, where I'm just sitting back relaxing going, no, yeah, I got like, 10 more minutes before I have to worry about this. Like I'm good, you know, uh, while I'm waiting, you know, it may, <laughs> which I think would trip some people up who assume that perceivers are all like, you know, whatever till the last minute. And it's like, no, no, actually that may be more of a J person who just knows what their plan is and that they're doing it later, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
It depends on a case by case basis. So a lot of things can look like a lot of things, basically. Like sometimes I notice with SE or like SE DOMs especially is like they'll have in the moment whims. So they can look more almost like more J like because they'll go like, I really feel like doing this. We're going to do it now when it's really not. It's just um, <laughs> like having a, an in the moment impulse and then wanting to act on it. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like as soon as something pops up, I have to get done there and I'm like pushing towards it. I've just got that itch and I got to take action. Mm -hmm. I was like, for like I, the ISTPs, like Brian and Mara. I've never been one to put off la um, to last minute important things. So I've never fit that that um, perceiver stereotype of, say, studying for your exam all night before the test. I've never done that. I was studying for my exams a week before the test. But I was also raised by a military mother. So maybe that's factor. <laughs> <laughs> so I never did things super last minute. But I don't have much of a problem if I have a lot of things going on working up to the last minute. Like that doesn't really stress me out. I just... Keep on I'd say for me, it's almost like the, the more important things I will procrastinate on and do them last minute. And the little things that I know I will forget about, that's when I say, okay, there's no better time than the present. I'll do it right now because I'll know I'll forget about it because it's not important. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Interesting. I also feel like I kind of ride the waves of motivation too. Yeah, same. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel that, you know, that moment of motivation, I'll go tackle the big thing. Otherwise, until that comes, I'm tackling all the little things so I can just say I've done something. Yeah, yeah. In a large part, it just kind of all ties back to the to how much you're thinking about it. I think for the STJs, they tend to when, when they have something that they need to do that that basically kind of hijacks your thought process. So everything now becomes about okay. When am I going to? When am I going to fit it in? Am I going to do it now? Am I going to do it later? How is this going to work with everything else that I need to get done or what I that I want to get done? And that's why it can vary from person to person when the thing actually happens. Because I think for the SDJs, a lot of the time, it's because they either decided that it was the best for them to do it now or it was best to do it it'll fit in this time slot better i think for the as a user it tends to be more it, it's less planned out from from what i've seen they 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 kind of do it either it's like okay i need to do it now because if i don't do it now i'm going to forget about it or it's a i don't really feel like doing it now i'll i'll wait until i have the proper motivation to do it or i feel like doing it because I know it's going to be a slog if I try to do it now when I don't want to do it. And I, I, I'm less like that. I'll just do it to get it done, even though I know it's going to be a slog and, and I don't want to do it. But, you know, it's like I, I just need to get it done now. Um, I think for the SD users, they, they probably have a higher preference for I would rather not do it now if I don't have to, if I don't feel like doing it now. I would rather wait for the moment where I do feel like doing it and then do it then. It'll be much faster to do it later when I feel like doing it than to do it now when I don't feel like doing it. It's time efficiency. Touche, yeah. <laughs> there's a little bit more linearness and planned outness with the STJs and there's a little more with the STPs riding the waves of motivation and doing it when they feel like doing it. Ryan said something uh, really good on the side of like, we can't, when we get a problem, we have to sit there and post process it until we have a plan. Like, and the plan may be we have to do it now or the plan may be we have, we're going to do it later, but I don't feel comfortable until I have my plan. Right. Like that just it doesn't kind of hijacks. It kind of hijacks the thought process until you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think about a new thing until I know when I'm going to put it in. But like Mark, but Mars said that, you know, they're waiting for the, the time feeling of for the motivation to be at its highest to do it done, get it done where I don't care if I have the motivation to get it done or not, I can still do it right now. Mm. Like if the boss comes to me and says, I want you to do this menial, annoying task right now, I may not want to, but I have no problem doing it and just ignore, you know, like I don't have to wait on my motivation to get things done. I can be unmotivated. And when I'm unmotivated, I probably still am working at the same speed I am when I'm motivated. 
Like yeah, that speed, that speed favorite. does not change whether or not I'm motivated or whether or not I enjoy this. It has no, there's no bearing on me it, when it comes to that. I, I'll just like, so I don't like it. I'm, I'm not reading my book, so I'm just going to get this done. Mm. Like this was work. I work. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is, or what process do you go through? Cause this is actually something I've noticed about my STJ friends, actually. Like, it seems like they can do every single task, like with the same amount of effort, whether they want to do it or not. And that's something like, I just can't, I can't do. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if it's necessary. It, it, it might easy? honestly yeah. just be because the motivation just appears when something needs to get done, even if you don't feel like doing it because you know that it's going to bug you until you've dealt with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm almost kind of wondering if it has more to do with, it's just like the motivation comes with the task, whether you want the motivation or not, because you know, you're not going to be able to relax again until you've taken care of it. And it's not kind of nagging in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something I envy with the STP sometimes that they can just kind of compartmentalize something and be like, yeah that's a problem for tomorrow me not yeah. today and then literally just completely forget about it and not worry about it i can't do that yeah. mm. <laughs> okay so it's like trying to get back to that si homeostasis like that's all the motivation you need right there like you're yes. not able to relax so you're getting back to that awesome like like especially for me being an si dom that that's very important for me to have mm. kind of everything back to a flat plane because mm -hmm. I, I hate I hate having stuff on my plate. I did yeah. just to be completely honest with you. I I want I want an open schedule. I want nothing to be required of me. I want everything to be done. And that that is in a perfect world that would be my constant state. Um so yeah, anything that kind of comes up, I want to take care of it pretty much as quickly as I can just so I can get back to not having anything that I need to do. That makes sense. Really, really interesting. Or at least for me, I have to get back. I have to, I don't feel comfortable until I have a plan. Like, mm. I don't have to do it right now. Like, I'm okay with putting it off till later, but only if I know I'm do. if it's a plan is to put it off till later. Mm, like, okay. I have, I have the event planned out, mm. but it goes in later in the seat, later in life at a time. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where the ISTJ and the ESTJ are starting to kind of diverge. <laughs> because having that TE at the top, it's like the plan is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Having the SI at the top, it's the not having anything to do and going back to just observing is the most important thing. I, I think what you were saying is a thinking dominant because I can kind of relate to that where if I have, I can have a general plan of action for something I'm going to do eventually. And that's enough for me to be completely calm and fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's probably putting your decision function at the top like that. Like I've got my decision made, my plan of action. Cool. And so my next question for everyone is, what is your relationship with skepticism? I can be very skeptical until I have like concrete facts. So I'll listen to what you say and I'll be like, mm, okay. But like, I'm also aware like you could be biased. You could have a personal agenda against this person or wh whatever facts are thrown my way. There, there could be a personal agenda behind you telling me these facts. So for me, it's like, take it with a grain of salt until I physically see it or unless it actually makes sense. Like if I can make sense of it, but even if I can make sense of it, I think since TI is second, I still trust my SE first and want to see this, these facts for myself. I'm skeptical of hyperbole, essentially. Uh, anytime somebody's trying to sell me something, anytime somebody's trying to tell me how, and anything hyperbolic, really if it sounds too good to be true it probably is you know um i'm very very skeptical of everything unless you know it's it's two plus two equals four i'm not skeptical of everything but i am i'm kind of picky about who i Mama. trust to Mama. to give me the information Hold on just a I'm very skeptical about almost everything. If, if unless unless you can show me and prove it and demonstrate it, I'd I'd basically take it with a big grain of salt for the most yep. part. Yep. Like if you can't give me physical evidence to back up your claim, then I probably am 
not going to put much weight on it unless I've done it before or I've seen something similar to it. And then my own experience will basically back up what you're saying. But yeah, I I don't put a lot of weight in just something that someone said. I'm probably skeptical of things I need to rely on. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm generally skeptical of everything because I don't feel like I need to be. Yeah. But if it's something I need to rely on and actually like I might have to, you know, deal with, I guess, and I, I do get skeptical of it. Yeah. I think I'm s skeptical if you, not, not hyperbole, but if you don't seem like you've got the experience to warrant talking about it, and you're talking on a grander scale than you have the background for, I get real skeptical. Like, I trust authority figures, but only as far as they actually are an authority on the matter. Like, if you, you know, if you actually know what you're talking about with this, that's fine. If this is really not something, like, if you're just speaking off the cuff, then I, you know, I'm going to be skeptical about it or, you know, like, and then I, I'm also very, um, if you, uh, if I thought you might've been, uh, somebody I should listen to, but then decided I shouldn't listen to you anymore because you couldn't back up what you said, it's very hard for me to get back to the place of being convinced that you are somebody I should listen to, you know, like, you know, if you prove yourself somebody that I can't, is too uh, skeptical, I'm just, it's hard for me to regain that trust that what you say is true. Interesting. I definitely like to play devil's advocate too. So, you know, if you come to me, oh, I think this about this, and you're freaking out about it, I'll play the devil's advocate and be like, could it be this? And I'll kind of draw things back to the physical, like observable world, just to, just to check. And I think I'm thinking more like experiences with people telling you things, but yeah. Yeah, see, I, I tend to go after the results. Mm -hmm. Like, were the results real or were the results wrong and fake? I'm wondering what everyone's relationship is to people. Like just, I don't know, the concept of people or hanging out with people. Are you asking how friendly we are? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Psycho class. <laughs> no. <laughs> How comfortable we are with people? Like, uh, or, um, are we in touch with emotions? I mean, like. <laughs> I don't think... <laughs> Sorry, you're making my any shoot ideas at you. So just you know, know you're gonna have to refine this a little bit. <laughs> Like, how like do, we what do we bond people? with our friends over? Is that what you're asking? I mean, like, I think she means like, how do you view people? Like, do you view people as like friends that have relationships with? Why do you have those relationships? Are people tools to get things done for you? Because that's what a lot of people think about STs. Yeah, yeah. Carl's was worried about, that was what I was trying to ask. Yeah, she's trying to ask in a polite way without being like, are you guys psychopath? <laughs> I get it. It's fine. Yeah. I prefer not to think of you as a tool, but I'm totally willing to think of you as a tool if that's what it takes to get the job done. Like, I mean, I would rather know people as people, but I've also been in work positions. And usually if I'm thinking of you as a tool, it's because we're working and now you're a tool because we're getting something done. If we're not working, then you're not a tool. You're a friend and how close we are just depends on, you know, shared time and interests and all those typical factors. It depends on the relationship. Generally, I see talking to people as like an experience and I just want to have a good experience with this person, right? I just want to have fun and make the moment. Um, I don't know if I get like too attached per se, unless like we actually go deeper like and actually have like a, a, a deep relationship that's built through talking and shared experiences and whatnot. But generally, do I see people? I know like everybody has that, like I've seen the common stereotype of ESPs. I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I, I guess like if you're unhealthy, you could do that. But I guess I can sometimes see people's tools like in a work situation, similar to what Amy said, like 
I'll see like the chessboard. If I join like a company, I'll see the chessboard of the corporate like landscape. And then I'll kind of be like, hmm, what position do I want? And then I'll go and I'll build the relationships to get that. Cause I know I'm going to kill it in like actually delivering the results. But I also know I have to have the relationships there as well. And then generally I will build the relationship there and then it will delve into something else later. So I would say, I guess to round it up with a bow, I value people through experiences. First off, whatever shared activity we're doing, work, uh, partying, having fun, like nightlife type stuff, whatever, that's basically what it's about, that experience. And then through like all those shared experiences and probably having deep conversations, I kind of like peel back the layers and can build a, a very tight friendship. And I found that, I don't know, I just kind of have levels of people. Like I have a lot of acquaintances, but I also have a lot of, I guess, what I call activity friends. And then I have like my inner circle of people who like I truly vibe with because I know they're solid. I know like their experiences, they know mine and we've built that relationship. But you, you won't find me being like your best friend after two days now. But I know a lot of people do work that way. I've noticed they'll be hitting me up and say I'm their best friend. And I'll be like, huh? Like, when did we get to this level? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So something Charles says again and again is this is an experience. And that's something SE doms really do throughout their life. It's like everything is an experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost hard. It's like, does everybody not do this? <laughs> like, I've always thought that was normal, but I'm learning like, there's different ways to perceive the world, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of funny because, I mean, this is technically a little skewed off the side, but as an SI Dom, I relate to this as an experience, but it's more of this is going to be an experience, as in now I'm required to go through this experience and I might not want to. <laughs> and that is the other side of the sensing doms, where the SI Doms are going, I know which experiences I want to partake in. And if it's not one of them, I probably don't want to. And that I think is in kind of, that's like the I versus the E happening because I feel like with the SE Doms, it's more of a, this is an experience. I wonder what it's going to be like. I kind of excited to see how it's going to unfold and what we're going to do. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to unfold. And that means that I might not enjoy myself. So, this is going to be an experience. It's more of a this is kind of nice. sigh instead of a excitement. <laughs> I see this verbatim with my ISTJ friends. I'm like, bro, it's going to be fun. You're going to have a good time. When have I ever steered you wrong? And they're like, nah, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to do it. Like, it's the same vibe. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's funny. But what I was trying to say there is the focus is on the experience in both situations. It's just a different perspective on it, but they're both focused on the fact that it is an experience. And that that's kind of what I was pointing out with them both being sensing leads. Um, but for me, as far as, I, I think there's too much of a bad stigma with the whole thing of viewing your friends as, as tools. It's, it's not that you view them as a tool. It's more a product of the way that your mind works. You see everything in the way that how is it useful? Yep. And that it does go and it's imprinted on people as much as it is on things. And it's not because you don't like people, you don't want friends, but that lens is still there. It's not really something that you can turn off. It's, it's, a, it's a definition. It's a character, yeah. identifying characteristic. Traits, yeah. Of these right. people, it's a trait, and in uh, I would not hesitate to say I would collect tools of people who don't share my strengths or who know who bring fun to the party and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If that's what I need, like that's that's not something I would hesitate to collect and when i say it's a tool i just mean like what are you good at like what are you gonna function well at you know how like if you're i don't want to shove you into doing something you're not going to be good at or that you're going to be mad at me for because that slows and ruins everything to do that so i mean it 
yeah, it's a tool, but that's kind of like, okay, so what do I want to ask you to do? What's going to make you, when you get to my party, what's going to make you feel comfortable when you walk in the door? Being left alone, you know, over to the side till somebody comes behind you? Being asked to, you know, go refill dishes, you know, for food, you know, hey, I, I have a new friend. Would you please go talk to them? You know, they've never been here. They're new to the group, you know, go, you know, go talk to them. Like, what is your great skill set? You know, I want to utilize that when I say that you're a tool. Like, same thing, like I was a manager for McDonald's and like you had to sit there and you were evaluating, you know, you get this crew that you get assigned, you know, because of schedules. And then you guys sit there and play you know, jingle uh, jigsaws of who can I put in which position to make it go the most effective flow through because I might be the best at everything, but that's not the most helpful for me to necessarily work my best position if that means everybody else is in their worst positions. You know, I may need to work my worst position so that they can be in their best position so that everything goes well. And, but I think it's that ability to, you know, we can kind of call it a tool because we can disassociate the emotional aspect of it while evaluating these great criteria of people to put them in the slot of where they're most effective. I love the way you said that. Cause I feel like it's inverse, just like we've been saying all night for the STPs where it's like, we see where we fit. And then once we get to where we fit or we see where we want to be like in the system based on our strengths, like, Oh, I'm going to be able to look the best here or here. And then that's when that experience comes in. When people come into that factor, it's just like, oh, okay, well, you're part of this experience in this new position that I've that I've picked, where it's like STJs are actually putting people in the the position. It's like inverse, I guess I would say, the way I think about it. And like, I don't know if like this is ST thing, but I think like since we're the most traditional, I think all this comes from like just how society it was before modern times, where like you had a use or a, a characteristics or traits about you that made you useful in certain positions and you did that and you built relationships around that position you were in whether you were a hunter or whether you were like growing crops and that's just kind of the way that human society has always been but now since things like are a lot easier on us nowadays everybody's kind of developing into this um because i'm gonna be honest i don't exactly understand the mindset behind like uh enfp buddies of mine that they really just live to like build a relationship with every single person and they're like that's their focus they have no thoughts about like well i don't care about money i don't care about career like even the ones that i work with at work like we had a talk yesterday and she told me like she would give away all her money and like she doesn't need all of it and she's she's privileged and she doesn't need her privilege and she would live in a box if it helped other people i don't relate to that necessarily i'm like what what are you talking about like uh, i'm sorry but i can't i can't get on that wave but um, yeah, it's just, I think that's how we see it. And then other types look at it and they may see that are right or wrong, but that's basically what it is. Seeing everything is like how it can be utilized or where we can be utilized, I think, in the TIS and SETI sense of things. I feel like I can recognize people's skill sets, but I'm not necessarily, I never see myself as seeing people as tools because as much as I possibly can, I'm gonna try not to need to use people at all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, see, that's why that's all different. I am absolutely interdependent by nature, and I I need those peoples, and it drives me nuts if I get stuck doing everything myself. And I kind of wonder if that's like an extroverted versus introverted thing because I'm just not on that. But like, I can recognize where people have strengths and weaknesses, but um, by and far, my preference is to not have to even interface with them on that level at all. If I can do it all myself, I just want to do it all myself and not have to worry about how they're going to fit or coordinate with me. And it's, I think it's mostly the stigma in the way that it's worded because other people are doing the same thing. They're just not using the same words to describe it. So, like, Effie Doms are looking at people and they are instantly recognizing how they fit within a group how that they mesh with other people and that's it's the same idea with different words and I, it really is i just think we say it without any emotion and just flatly for what it is and it sounds very wrong right because when you when you completely when you're looking at something and you're kind of stripping all of the emotional aspect out of it or or stripping away the compliments or the niceness or when you're when you're Drilling everything down to 
it's practicality. It sounds mean sometimes because it's like when you take away all the this is person's a nice person or this this person's great at this and you're just going you do this you do this well that's helpful it makes it sound like you're looking at them like they're a tool for use it's like you're useful to me because you do this thing you do it well here come be my friend because i need somebody that's good at that <laughs> But I would equate that to a friend, though. I would say, come be my friend so you can do this for me. I don't think like that at all. <laughs> right. But that's how it seems like it comes off to people when you're talking about it. It's like, and you have friends that are legitimately your friends, but then you're focusing on, it's like, oh, yeah, I have this really great friend who's really good at this thing. And then it sounds like you have this friend because they're good at this thing. And that's not necessarily the case. It's just the things that you notice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I totally get that because I'm married to an INFP and he thinks very differently than I do. And he's very in touch with his FI, which I am not. And I'm ever so grateful that he is, that's easy for him because it helps me try to navigate that myself. And, but I love him and I married him, not because he was an INFP, but for other reasons. So I wouldn't want somebody to assume that, hey, you made an INFP just to dualize yourself and to make this part of your life easy. And I want to look at them and say, right. no, that's not why I married him. I married him for the, he's a good, he's a good man. We have similar uh, shared morals and values. That's why I married the man and he loves me and he puts me first. Like, that's why I married him. Like we could put it, you know, he could have been a different, any of the other personality types. And if he would have had those same character qualities, I could have fallen in love, you know, could have fallen in love with that other guy over there too, for the, you know, and like, I mean, if an Effie's in charge of the party, they're probably still asking me to do the same thing a TE Doms asks me to do when I get to the party. Like, they're, they're just, just probably asking, they're going to use different words, maybe not the same inflection. Um, <laughs> or as is often common for me, I get to the party in the, if the Effie knows me, they'll go ahead and ask me. Otherwise, if the Effie doesn't know me all that well, then I'm just going to start volunteering and doing what they would have asked me to do. Like... <laughs> hey, your chip bowl is empty. Where are the chips? Let me go get them. Like, you know, uh, yes, I brought all four of my children because my husband wants to be alone. And uh, are you are you worried your children are crying? Are they really crying? Or are they just like, you know, need to shake it off and get on with life? You know, like how big, you know, how, how big of a bump really is this going on here? You know, before I have to stop talking to you to go deal with them, like, you know, which, which bothers, you know, some people that, you know, it's like, no, really, I do care if my children get hurt. I'm just, you know, I want them. There are other skills I value sometimes that are not the skills you value. And please don't judge me for the fact that, you know, <laughs> trying to build a little resilience here. <laughs> yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so my next question for everyone is, I'd like to return back to a comment Ryan made about how the STPs have a, have a sliding scale of inconvenience when assessing experiences and SI, so the STJs, have a good or bad experience type of measurement. And I was wondering if we could go into that. It kind of cut out there for me. Did you say like experiences, uh, good or bad? Or did you say like, was it back to when we were talking about like uh, not following things through and doing them the same way over and over? Like she was being talking about, it, it was technically, it technically both those things were um, rolled into it, but she, she was talking about, she wants you to kind of explain how the whole sliding scale of inconvenience works for you. Like mm. what's that threshold? What, what does it take to get there? Why, why is it that way? That, that kind of thing. Uh, I would say it doesn't affect me. That's just simply because like, I'm going to this, I don't know how this sounds, but I'm basically going to mold the experience and make it what I want it to be. So it's like, let's say I was to like, go to a like party in college where I knew no one by the end, like, I'm just going to start talking to people and pushing on like m my own agenda for the night. And then it, like, it's going to be what I want it to be. Or like, if it's a work situation, whatever, like I kind of just rely, I guess that's like that SE where I'm going to push out and influence my environment. So it becomes what I need it to be at that time. When I have somebody's like upset, let's say like somebody's, 
annoyed or somebody has bad vibes, I'm basically going to press on that SE with them, go talk to them and force the conversation until they're laughing and like it's a good time. And so, yeah, that's just kind of how it is for me. I don't worry about having bad experiences because the minute I sense it's bad, I'm going to pinpoint why it's bad and fix that. Whether so it's for you, so for you, say, say, okay, so for, as an example, like, say your apartment is dirty and it keeps getting more dirty like what at what point does it become enough of an inconvenience that you start caring about like it being dirty you know what i mean like dirty clothes on the floor it's whatever i can just step over a piece of dirty clothes and it doesn't inconvenience me enough to deal with it versus a it's a mountain of dirty clothes on the floor now i can't move so now i got to do the laundry you know that kind yeah. of thing yeah, so this is like uh, where I think like SI parent comes in because when I was a kid, probably would have left it all day, like until my parents told me to do it. Now, like I like having my place clean and like immaculate and looking nice. So I tend to just, you know, I might throw like a, a sock or something on the floor, but best believe like once I see that I did that, like I'll pick it up because I don't like the way it looks. Like I like feeling like I'm in a nice area, a nice, well kept area. Um, so when I see that something's unkept, I immediately fix it. Yeah. So you'll notice this with SE dominant types. They are actually impacted by the lack of better word aesthetics of their environment. Um, yeah. so oftentimes you won't see them with mismatching socks on because they notice it. And yeah. so I lived with an ESTP for a long time and mm -hmm. he was actually really clean. Yeah. Um, and it's cause they get, inf they get uh, affected by their environment. If it looks bad, it affects how jammed up your brain feels and it, it doesn't feel clear enough to take action when you want to kind of take it. So it's a weird thing. I notice a lot of SC doms have it. So yeah. that, that's where like they go against that like J stereotype of having like an immaculate room because with some ESTPs, the SC will force them to like, they see exactly what's in front of them and they're like, this yeah. looks gross. And so they'll want to clean it up. On the converse, you might have an ice TJ at home where some parts of their house is very clean and then other parts are like very messy. It depends on where the SI is focusing on, which will depend whether or not they care. <laughs> I li like it tends to work out because I live with the ISTJ and they're very focused on like comfort and making sure that everything is like comfortable. And then I'm worried about aesthetics. So like when that's combined, like basically everything is just immaculate here, like all the time, like stuff is never going to be like anywhere wrong or anything like that. Like, so, yeah. 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 And, and like, for me, that's, I, I can somewhat relate to what you're saying, but on kind of a different level. So for me, it's, I want it a certain way. And if it's not that certain way, then I have to fix it. So it, it's kind of a similar impulse, but I think mine's more focused on, it's like, this is the way I like it. So it's it's not really a scale of, well, it's this dirty or it's this clean. It's, mm -hmm. I want it at this level. And if it's not at this level, it's a problem. But that's <laughs> yeah. good. That's going to vary from I, ISTJ to ISTJ. If that, yeah. that threshold could be from very messy to immaculately clean. Yeah. But for the SI, it's more about, Maintain, reaching and maintaining that level rather than it's clean or dirty, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. And I've seen that. So that makes sense. Funny. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> my, my sliding scale, if you want to say I have one, is I, I do have a sliding scale of bad experiences. Like, I really only keep the good experience. Like everything else goes into there's the good experience and then there's sequential list of bad experiences going down to <clears throat> catastrophe. And I'm definitely not picking, you know, the bottom ones, but, you know, occasionally will I have to pick, you know, second or third or fourth because I've got too much going on or there's other priorities that take precedence. And so I, you know, I don't have a choice to, but to pick something a little, you know, like I would like my kitchen to be this clean, but it's so dirty. I, and companies coming, I'm trying to get just the barest minimum that makes the most effect done. So that's what I'm trying to get. Or, you know, for me also SI is, is habits. So like some things were cleaner and then I had kids and I had babies and then I was tired and exhausted because I need a lot of sleep and did my house 
uh, standard slide big time because I just ran out of the capability to do things. <gasps> yeah, big time. And so like now that I'm finally done having kids and uh, I'm actually sleeping through the night consistently and stuff like that, are some of the standards like finally coming back? You know, like, yeah, like, you know, um, are there still some shortcuts I do, you know? Yes, I'm still using paper plates since my daughter was born, like, you know, 21 months ago. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, but, you know, I'm getting back to some things being done more the way I like them to, but it, it's, it's, it's more like, because I know I can repeat the good, the good result I want, I ignore my sliding scale most of the time. Like I have it, but most of the time I just ignore it because I can replicate what I want. So I don't have to have a sliding scale of tipping point because I know what I want. I can do that. The only time I consult my sliding scale is if I can't do what I want to do. Then I consult my sliding scale of what do I have time and capability for right now? It starts maybe backwards in a sense of like, it starts with this is how I know I can do it. This is what I'd like. And then I work backwards from there, depending on if I feel like I don't have the capability to get that done. And because good experiences are tracked and we put a time on it, if it's a good experience, we, we can track how long it took the good experience to take. I, it, it, the ability to forecast whether I can replicate that is pretty high. So I know whether or not ahead of time, probably whether or not I can get it done. Makes sense. How about Ryan and Mara? I'm trying to figure out exactly what we're talking about, right? Um, so uh, we from a messy room to a... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just generally like, so for me, it's, I think for me, it is actually less of a sliding scale. I, I'm, I'm more binary in that way where it's, it was good or it was bad. I don't do the bad and I strive to do the good. And that that's about all there is to it. If, I didn't enjoy the experience or negative experience. I'm just going to probably do everything in my power to not have that experience again and try to replicate the ones that were good experiences. So if that means that I'm going to have a very wide berth on certain things to avoid it happening, that's fine with me. It's not so fine yeah, with life other people sometimes, right but. <laughs> <laughs> my life's too crazy right now to do that. That's what I prefer to do. It's just too crazy. So I don't have the choice about that sometimes <laughs> or a lot of I times. Think, I think Mara, Mara is probably kind of on the other side of that where it's like, oh, this is a bad experience. Well, whatever. I mean, it didn't affect me that much. I guess <laughs> I'll do it again and I'll do it again in two days. And then I'll go, oh, well, that wasn't that great. Well, whatever. It's still bad. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. Like, Why? <laughs> Yeah. So with SE, it's less picky. And with SI, it's more picky. I, I, it definitely can. Be. I think it can be. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty picky with like food, though. And I've noticed SI users are not as, well, I don't know. It depends on the SI user. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me take that back real quick. Food is, food is kind of one of those things. Like, it's, I'm not saying you can't have a not picky SI user, but inherently with wanting things a certain way and liking things a certain way, there is inherently going to be a certain level of picky. I mean, you can have SI users that like a lot of different food, so you can get to a point where they don't seem that picky. Like, it's like, yeah. oh, well, what kind of food do you want? Well, it doesn't matter because I like all kinds of different. Mm -hmm. But then when you come up against that one that they don't like, then they're going to start looking picky yeah. again because that one that they don't like, they really yeah. don't want to eat that. <laughs> yeah. And that's something I wonder because sometimes they'll, you guys will think you don't like things that you do like. You just haven't tried it yet. So, like, I'll try to, like, give it to, like, my ICJ friends. They'll be like, oh, they'll say, oh, no, I don't like that. And it will be, like, two or three years. And then they'll try it, like, that like we went to uh, one of my friends didn't like uh, tacos. Right. And so I was like, how do you not like tacos? Like everybody likes tacos. But then I noticed they were eating a burrito and I was like, yo, so a taco is just a burrito not wrapped. And they were like, oh, and like then they tried it and they loved it. And I was like, this is what I've been saying like this whole time. But like, 
Yeah, it's like they, it wasn't in their memory bank, so they're like, no, there's no way that can be good. I hate that. So, I mean, there could be a couple different reasons for that. Um, the ones that would come to the top of my head is that they did have a bad taco one time. Yeah. And that one bad taco basically ruined all tacos for the rest of eternity until somebody like you comes along and it's like, no, you need to try another taco. You might like it this time. Yeah. And, and I will admit that that is technically the weakness in, in the strategy that SI users like to implement is that it's like, well, just because it was bad one time doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to be bad or you may have just gotten that one bad experience where it is, oh, by and large, usually overly positive, Ooh. but you just happen to have the one time that was bad. So now you're avoiding it for forever because you would rather just stick to the things that you know you like mm -hmm. and not have to risk having another bad taco. So you're just willing to not participate in good tacos because you don't want another bad one. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what ends up happening. That's exactly it's either, the, yeah. Right. It's, so it's either they'd rather just stick to the things they know they like, or they had one bad one one time and they just don't want to try it again and risk having another bad one. That, that's usually the two main things. Yeah. But we mm. just have that well, good like, experience. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, no, no, never again. Yeah. I love a wide variety of food, but like, if I'm served a bad version of something, like that's when I get picky, like the SI kicks in, like I am never ordering this again from here or, you know, like, please do not replicate this particular version of it. Like, you know, um, or, but the reverse is also too, like if I go to a restaurant and I order something and it turns out really great, I want to order it again. And I'm hoping that it comes back out of the kitchen the same way the next time. And I'm right. rather irritated if it doesn't come back the same the next time, you know? So like, I think that's why chain restaurants are so popular because in big chain restaurants, in theory, they make this everything the same way every time. It's consistent. Like, I know when I worked for yeah. McDonald's, everything had to be done exactly the same way because they said, not that you can't have a better way, but we want every store, every McDonald's, every Big Mac to be exactly the same. So you have to do it this way because we want the same result. And right. it, it is one of those things where, you know, <laughs> I want it, you know, within, you know, a range of what the ideal is, you know. I'm not very picky at all. And I don't even think like when it comes to food or anything, I like most things, there's very few things I will not eat. And the reason I will not eat them is I will throw them back up. But there are very, very few things that reach that. <laughs> But I think like at one point, Ryan was telling someone that I, I'm very picky. I don't let, there's all these things I don't like, well, no, 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 I'm fine with those things. But if you lay out a, 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 um, I think it's not a word, a, a buffet of, of items, I will probably consistently go for this item over here. It doesn't mean I dislike all those other items over there. If those were the only items that were my options, I would eat those items just fine because I'm really not that picky, but I will, you know, prefer this thing over here if that is among my options but I'm not necessarily super picky when I'm eating any one thing either. Like, cause I'm not comparing it to the way it was before or the best version of it. And it's, you know, I get very convenience oriented mm. it's food. I'm eating it. It's edible. I can move on with my life now. <laughs> I, I haven't spoke up in a minute, but that little food story kind of like had me thinking maybe this is relevant. Um, if there's a cookie and a brownie, and I take the cookie and somebody says to me, why don't you like brownies? It's like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's really difficult for me to <laughs> deal with uh, because I don't understand how people come to those types of conclusions based on that limited bit of information. I had yes. the choice between one of the two. It doesn't mean I don't like the other one, but when you say, exactly. well, how, what, you don't like brownies? What? 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 If all you fed me were brownies, I'd be very happy. But if you yeah. fed me cookies, I'd be happier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, I I get that too. Or, or, or I see that on like, you know, on social media and stuff like that. It, it's like this, hey, you know, you like one of these things. Does this mean you hate the thing right next to it? It's like, what? What made you think I hated the thing right next to it? Like, why, why do I, 
I love brownies. I love cookies. Like, 75% of the time, I'm probably going for the brownie first, but I happen to go for a cookie this time, so now you have to shoot me? Like, <laughs> why, why, why do you have to? Like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like, it, I've got a food allergy to where I throw up if I eat it, so it's kind of one of those, like, you know, and, and the thing is, like, I had it several times before I figured it out, so I'm like, now it's the bummer of my life that I can't eat it anymore, and it's like, oh, okay. No, people, I don't hate my allergy. I actually like that food. I just have an allergy, and you will not like the results if I have too much of that. So, like, <laughs> why would you? <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. My last question for everyone is, what is your relationship with your emotions? What's that? This question again. <laughs> That's my answer. I was like, my, my what? Huh? <laughs> uh, my, my emotions are probably, my relationship with my emotions is probably along the lines of, I, I feel them and I know they're there, but I mean, it's kind of not the most important thing in the world. It's like, I, I can't not feel them i mean i i'm very i i know that they're happening but they usually stay on the inside and maybe leak out in a facial expression but i i tend to try to keep it all more or less i don't know suppressed is the right word because it's, it's not really suppressed in the sense that i'm, I'm forcing myself not to feel what i'm feeling but it, it's more of a i'm just keeping it contained um i'm not really putting a lot of importance on what i'm feeling i'm more worried about what needs to be done so if it's going to make me feel bad but it gets the result that i want i'll deal with the feeling bad while i'm doing it to get done what i need to get done and i feel like some people might focus you cross-eyed for doing that because they say that you're making yourself miserable but i mean it's it, there might be some truth to it, but at the end of the day, I'd rather just reach the goal and I'm not going to stop from getting to the goal just because I had some bad feelings along the way. So I think uh, for myself, I basically feel two emotions, <laughs> rage and excitement, and there's not really an in-between. In between all that, is basically, I think like FE, like tertiary FE makes up for my blind spot FI. So like I do emotions, but like, so it's like they come out at times, but I'm not actually like pinpointing. I guess I when I talk to like my buddies who are like INFPs, ENFPs, uh, they tend to really like know how they're feeling and mull it over for hours, like literal hours. They can dive into the emotion and like, what have I felt this way before? What does it connect to? What is the deeper thing behind this? For me, it's a lot of like, like I said, I basically either feel rage or excitement, like excitement for the weekend and when we're doing something exciting. Rage, like the reason I say rage is because a lot of things that make people like angry don't really get to me like it's very hard to like get to me you can i guess annoy me that would be another thing you can annoy me but at the end of the day like fe is going to still take over and we're still going to have a good time but <clears throat> i guess if i was thinking like real authentic like you're in your emotions are in control and you're not like logically aware of everything probably rage and excitement but that's basically my my uh, relationship. There's like an extreme. There's not a continuum. There's just an extreme, and the ninety nine percent that we're in between those extremes, it's basically just a reaction to the environment in the moment. You said something funny, I laughed. You said something like, I guess, depressing. Like I was like, hmm, that's depressing, and then moved on. Simple as that. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> it's just that that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can relate to some of that. I don't dwell on my emotions very much. If I am completely alone, I am a very calm, mellow, even person where I don't feel a whole lot. I don't think it's when people get involved that there starts to be a, a mix of things going on. But I don't really prefer to think about my emotions if I can get away with it. <laughs> and yeah, I usually, I feel a lot of, I'll feel the angers and I'll, I'll feel the excitement 
and the rest I try to avoid. I think for my type, it, it, it ends up turning into a lot of, it's like, I'd prefer not to feel things very much. So it turns kind of into a game of, it's like, if that made me feel negatively, unless there was a goal attached to it, I'll just avoid it because of the inconvenience attached. So when, when it's not goal attached, any kind of emotions that are going to get me away from that kind of even, I'm probably going to, if I can avoid having to deal with it or going into those kind of experiences, because at the end of the day, like I said before, my, my primary goal is to kind of have that calm even in my life. And I don't really like the ups and downs and Frequently, when emotions are getting involved, mine or others, it, it makes up and downs happen. So that's not preferable. <laughs> so those things tend to get worked around. It's like, okay, well, how can I make that not happen again kind of thing? So. Yeah, I would agree with the keeping it even thing. I just tend to be a very happy person as a general rule. And like, I'm happy with the good results of what I'm choosing to do right now. But. I'm totally willing if to get the good results I want is going to make me unhappy to power through. Like I'm, you know, uh, emotions are real. And I would say I'm happy when I get good results, which I think makes some people funny because they look at my results and they're like, why would your good results make you happy? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and it's like, well, why wouldn't good results make me happy? Like, you know, we just got this done the fastest way it was possible. Yeah, but we had to work so hard. Yeah, but we got it done the fastest way possible. That just makes me happy. Like, what, what wouldn't that make me happy? You know, so, <laughs> um, um, uh, I prefer to organize and make everything efficient so that people are happy. You know, I would prefer that. It's not always practical. Um, so to do that. And I'm totally willing to, if, if the way out is through, then we're going through those unfun emotions and we're just going to get to the other side of it. And then, then we can get back to happy because, you know, that's over and done with and now it's in the past and we can, you know, move on to things. And I think we, I've had to learn to be more aware of other people's emotions and take care of them because otherwise I've gotten in trouble. And I've also figured out that some people jump faster when you say please as opposed to just saying jump. So, like, those are just things I've had to learn, you know? <laughs> I'd still prefer to just tell you to jump, you know? Um, which is why I love doing projects with other girls that are uh, um, thinking thinker girls as opposed to feeler girls sometimes when I'm doing projects because I can just say jump and they don't get mad at me. So, <laughs> which is a really nice feeling, but I've learned to more so finesse my way around dealing with others. Great, great. And so thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you for representing the ST temperament and the wonderful no-nonsense common sense reality checkness of these types and how you all get to the point in your own way and it's really great to hear about how with the stps <laughs> they have this almost a, a tolerance for experiences and having an openness to experiences a better way to put it so it's almost like you know, this experience could be bad or it could be good, but I'm open to the experience. Uh, and it's nice to see the STJs having a more planned approach to how they're going to approach experiences. It's like, oh, it was bad. All right, I'm going to try to strategize so I don't experience this bad <laughs> experience. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and it was really nice to learn about the emotional or the lack there of emotional spectrum between your types. <laughs> that, you know, it seems like extroverts on a whole, gen this is generalizing, they seem to like more energizing emotions. So rage is actually an emotion that energizes you and it's exciting. And 
happiness is actually an energizing emotion too. Whereas it seems like you're all level or even keeled, but there's a slight trend towards that too. And so that's rad. <laughs> it's also nice to hear about how y'all see the usefulness inside things and the practicality of things. We need all of your BS detectors. <laughs> it helps whenever someone's saying something that's unrealistic or just doesn't make sense or is impractical to plant their feet more on the ground. <laughs> so yeah, I respect that. And so everyone go check out both Ryan and Mara's Practical Typing website. It is a very, very good website that takes away the biases of the typical places where you'll read about type. And they really talk about the meat of type and, and they take away some of the misinformation from the community and they, they help purify our knowledge. So if you want the, the purified knowledge of Ryan and Mara, go, go check out Practical Typing. I love it. They use examples and not archetypes. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. Oh, Amy's dislike of NI right there. <laughs> it's hard, guys. It's hard. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And also go check out Brian's YouTube channel, which is the Genzennial. He has really good tool videos and other videos as well. And yeah, what's not to love? Thanks, Amy, for your your straightforwardness and how you communicate. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's really great how you're able to e expand uh, a lot on your points. And that provides a lot of detail that makes it easier to kind of comprehend the ST mentality there. So, A. <laughs> um, and thanks, Charles, for your ability to kind of seize opportunities or seize the moment by seeing in the moment what you could almost tackle with the most relevance and that would matter the most. And that is your SE superpower. So thank you everyone for this wonderful time together and I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Mm -hmm.